God created this for man. Man created this for God. Community Christian Church, 1944 South Jackson Street, Frankfort, Indiana. Come, join us. It's good to be back. Thank you for having me back. You always, you preach a sermon and, and the old idea, remember when they used to have revivals? Well, they would tell young preachers you got to have five really good sermons and probably a fast car. <laughs> That's back when we motivate, motivated people by shaming them into doing what they ought to do. And we're not going there. The love of God constrains us, not the shame. Our shame, we just celebrated its passing on the cross. What a memorable and memorial time we just had. Today, um, you know, not knowing what had been preached here in the past or how long or what books or anything like that, I struggled a little bit this week. I was tempted. I've never done good at all going back and getting old sermons. I just, it's kind of like eating the leftovers that got left out all night. You're just not sure, you know? So anyway, I just decided I've never been let down by just staying with the Scripture. I started in Ephesians last week, and I thought, you know, Paul was so impressed with these people um, that I thought, you know, I think I'm just going to keep going. So I'm not going to give you however many sermons I'm here. I'm going to give you one sermon that's going to be for that many weeks. So if you want to read about next week's sermon, you just head on down to the second chapter and study it out. You may have something you can tell me as I walk in the door that's better than anything I've thought about all week. I was in Mexico several years ago for a missionary trip where we went down and built a house for a family. And there was a, an older gentleman there. We were building a house for his family. He would go up into America. This was just south of Tijuana. He would go up into America and he would work in the fields and he loved his life. Um, I didn't understand this, but the first time I saw him, he was standing about this deep in kind of a gravel, sand, stone mix, and he was shoveling it over into a screen, and the rocks would stay on top of the screen, and they would throw those aside, and, and then they would keep the sand because we were gonna make cement to make for the house, and we needed that sand and a smaller pebble in this. You, those of you guys who have done it, you know what I'm talking about. Well, at the end of the day, I couldn't figure out why this guy had been standing there and why he let the truck pour the sand over him from his waist down. I found out that he had had knee surgery the day before, and it was his way of not feeling anything and knowing that he wasn't going to bend in the wrong way. And we thought, well, you know what? That's kind of dumb. At the same time, that's kind of ingenious. Before we left, we got ready to pray for him and pray for the house that we built. And the bond all week was amazing. Uh, when we got there, they were happy. And when we left, they were happy. We thought they would be happier because we built them a nice big house, but they wanted to pray for us. Because they said, you know, we go into America and we see what happens there. New Americans are very distracted. You've got TMS. TMS? I've heard of TMI, too much information. What's TMS? Too much stuff. You know what? Every one of us today probably have struggled this week with some issue coming from too much stuff to take care of. You know, sometimes if we prayed a prayer, Lord, make me more faithful to you, it might mean us not having as much stuff. And that's what this gentleman prayed for us. And I've never forgotten that. Today, I am not going to shame you. That's a motivator that we've used before. I'm not going to shame you into anything. I don't want to put a bunch of rocks in the backpack that you already carried in here with the struggles you have in life. But I hope I show you something that you want so much that you'll move there out of joy and out of a sense of I want that in my life. You know those sweet moments we just had as we worship together in the songs, the words. You know there are people around that have driven past this building in the last hour that don't have any peace. They don't know what satisfaction even is. They wouldn't know where to go to find it. 
And yet we sit in here today having this wonderful assurance that Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. We have the friendships that we have around us. You are totally safe in this place. Not just for this life and today, but forever in Christ. Peace. Do you know where and how much people would give? Where would you turn for that? How would you get that? And yet we have it here today. What the world is looking for is what we're experiencing in this one moment here today. My soul is home with who I am and who God is. One of the things that happens to us is like happened in Isaiah 6. When Isaiah saw the Lord high and holy and lifted up, he got a hold of him. And all of a sudden, his focus was not upon himself or his stuff or his things. It was, Lord, what do you want? When we come here and worship and we sense God's presence, the next thing that we could or maybe can start thinking about is, God, what would you do with me this week? What do you, what do you want me to do to be kinder to my husband or my wife, more understanding to my children? That neighbor that bugs me, I can forgive him one more time and know that I can make a better chance for us to have a friendship. All of these things are things I hope we want to put together, but I've gotten this scripture today. Paul was a prayer. He really was. Now, where do you suppose Paul was when he wrote the book of Ephesians? Some happy place? On a vacation? You know, iced tea with a little umbrella in it? Where was he? Yeah. He was not in a happy place as far as the world's eyes. But he went to a happy place in his head, and guess what it was? The Ephesian people. And he's writing this out of the abundance of his walk with Christ. And so it's a lesson to us that we can pull up next to instead of feeling guilty about what we don't do or should be doing. We can realize that when Paul was in a tough place in life, he put his focus on God and what God had done in people that he had known in his life. And it transported him from the daily troubles of his life, being in prison, being in hardship, not knowing what the future was going to be, not knowing if he was going to get to use up all the money in his IRA or his 401k. He wasn't worried about that. He was focused on something that was eternal and already his. Today, I'm sure that many of you have listened to the news this week. And some of you walk away from the news going, what are we going to do? Christians are getting the short end of the stick. People don't like us anymore. It's getting to be a rough place to come and worship and have our, our expressions of faith out in the public. Things are tough. What's going to happen to America while there are terrorists around every corner? And that's just the news media. And, <laughs> and then there are ones that have guns and want to shoot at you and blow you up. I got this last night. We went out to supper with a delightful couple that have kids that are missionaries in Turkey and in Ghana. And they have to live with a daily concern. My kids are living out their faith where they could be killed at any time. There are terrorists there, not somewhere else, there. Radical people that don't want Christians around. And they gave me this, for this, gave me this to read, and I, I told Peg when I got this last night, I said, this fits. You want some good news? Fastest growing church in the world. Wanna know where it is? This is gonna knock your socks off. A new film tells the story of the fastest growing church in the world, an underground persecuted Christian movement in a country known for ex ex exporting radical Islamic terrorists, Iran. The fastest growing church in the world of Christians is in Iran. Did you hear that on the news this week? Oh, they forgot. You know, sometimes we let our minds run and we get beat down with all this other stuff in our Christian life. 
Oh, we're so weak. We're the minority. We aren't doing... God is still God. The air you just drew into your lungs was from Him. The pumping of your heart came at His will, not just the fact that you deserved it. Let me read this. People in Iran, a Muslim-majority nation, are fleeing from Islam in droves as believers bow their knees to Jesus and because aggressively pro are becoming aggressively pro Israel is that amazing according to the documentary the documentary is called sheep among wolves volume 2 any of you have seen it yet or seen one okay I haven't either but I'm gonna be looking for it what if I told you Islam is dead one unified Iranian church leader says this in a film which was produced by Frontier Allied International Studios. What if I told you the mosques are empty in Iran? He continued, what if I told you no one follows Islam inside Iran? Would you believe me? This is exactly what is happening inside Iran. God is moving powerfully inside Iran. Why haven't you heard that? Who doesn't want you as a Christian to know that? Do we have an enemy? And who, what does that enemy have control over? Things of this world. Let me read more. The pastor adds, What if I told you the best evangelist for Jesus was the Ayatollah Khomeini? The Ayatollahs brought the true face of Islam to light and people discovered it was a lie. After 40 years under Islamic law, you remember when they took our, our hostages and everything was bad against us and they took over? 40 years after, uh, under Islamic law, a utopia according to them, they've had the worst devastation in 5,000 years of history in Iran. More Iranians have come to faith in Jesus in the last 20 years than in the 1,300 years since Islam swept through Persia. Thomas calls this movement the Iranian Awakening. It owns no property, no buildings, no central leadership, and it is predominantly, predominantly led by women. Do I hear a woohoo on that, girls? <laughs> Named after the Bible verse in Matthew 10, 16, which says, Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves, the documentary claims Muslim background Iranians are leading a quiet but massive exodus out of Islam and bowing their knees to the Jewish Messiah with kindled affection toward the Jewish people. But the new believer in Islam, pardon me, but the new believers in the Islamic Republic face great risks. Well, you'd think it was a cakewalk now, right? No. We know that if we get caught, the first thing they will do to us as women is to rape us. They will then beat us and ultimately they will kill us. One believer said, this is the decision we have made that we want to offer our bodies as sacrifices because I have this thought when I wake up that when I leave the door, I might not be coming back. A leader of the Iranian underground church explains their goal is not planting churches, but rather making disciples. Did you hear me? This is what the Holy Spirit's movement is doing in a place that's far more dangerous than where we live. But rather than making disciples, the majority of whom are women, disciples forsake the world and cling to Jesus till he comes. Converts don't. See, I'm afraid we've got a lot of people who have just stepped inside faith and call it good. I'm a believer. I'm going to heaven. You wouldn't believe the things as a pastor or minister I hear when I go to a funeral home. Well, Uncle Joe's in a better place. Oh, he's up there fishing with so-and-so. You ever go to church? No. You ever hear him talk about Jesus? No. Well, where does their assurance come from? One of the reasons we're told that Islamic people, one of the bridges we have with Islamic people is the fact that there is no eternal life in the Koran. That's why they're interested in Jesus. We have what they want. They don't want more religion. They want what's best in their eyes for them, which would be eternal life. Let me finish this because I haven't even got, this is the introduction. 
And I know somebody's sitting in here with a timer, so I'm going to really keep moving. Disciples are engaged in a cultural war. Converts are not. Disciples cherish, obey, and share the Word of God. Converts don't. Disciples choose Jesus over anything and everything else. Converts don't. Converts run when the fire comes. Disciples don't. And the pastor explains everything they do underground is built on prayer. Did that sound like P-O-W-E-R? Power? No. Did that sound like intellect? Did that sound like the latest, greatest thing? The greatest philosophy? Isn't it amazing that God gives us a way to fight on our knees? We find people through prayer, not the media, not fancier worship services, not greater preachers, prayer. God is leading them one by one. You, what would happen if they talked to the wrong person? about their faith. By prayer. Jesus has come into their dreams or he has come miraculously into their life. When we hear this we know that Jesus has gone ahead of us. What would we do if we knew when we pray that God was going to go ahead of us and open all the doors. But sometimes we don't pray that way. That's why I've chosen this next scripture because we're going to talk about what Paul saw in prayer. Let's put, do you have on the, ready for, to go on the screen, Ephesians 1, 15. You could actually start at 13. I'll give you a second to put that up. If these guys, I, I messed with these guys last week because see, I learned that they're watching me. <laughs> If I was up there, I'd be going, what time is the real church service on? And anyway, I want you to get your Bibles anyway. Uh, one of the things that impressed me when Peg and I came here to church was you guys were carrying your Bibles into church. That's a little thing, but it was big to us. I want to go to a church where this is the authority. I know I'll have a home there. Starting in this passage, you have to kind of go with where we went last week. It talked about in verse 13 and 14. I want to read that. Chapter 1, and you, and after it gave, we were blessed, we were chosen, all these wonderful things we are in Christ. It says, and you were also included in Christ. Man, I love that phrase, in Christ. When you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, the good news of your salvation, when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal. Not a badge, a seal. The promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit, a guaranteeing of our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. I went to a lot of college so I can do what I do. And one of the things that was a question that we received as a freshman in Bible college was why did God do it? It meant everything. Why did God create the universe? Why did God create human life? Why did God do it? And we had four years until we had to answer that question. But we would not get a little diploma with a signature on it unless we could answer that question. Why did God do it? You see, science can tell us a lot about how. You just can't tell us why. Here's why. I just read it to you. To the praise of his glory. Now that may sound to you like self-serving and something like, well, God's an egotist. Why would he want all this glory for himself? Well, let me tell you. I don't care why or how. I get to be a part of it. Do you know how God expresses his glory through us. I get to be the tip of the spear in the glory of God when he uses me to do something to spread his good name and share it with you. If I expose it to you, then I get to be a part of his glory. That was what was said last week. And then we start, for this reason, 
You ever see therefore in your Bibles? You know why there's for? It's therefore so you go back and look at what was just said so you know why it's therefore. So once you know that, you can go on for this reason. Well, it might have been the reason that we have all been given these things and this name and this, this new identity in Christ. Or it may mean that we look on ahead for this reason. And it starts here with this in verse 15. Ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. You ever have anybody that loves you that much, they pray for you when they think of you? Let me ask you a real tough question this morning. And this isn't meant to put a rock in your sack. This is meant to encourage you. How would it feel if you knew where you're sitting right here? I'm pointing at every one of you. See this? I got every one of you pointed at. That somebody across the aisle had prayed for you by name this week. Prayed for you spoken your name to heaven, invoking God's power, his blessing in your life. Would it make, I got chills right now, thinking maybe somebody here prayed that I'd have a good enough sermon that God's glory would be seen today. Listen, Paul knew that these people were praying for each other. Let me read on. I got to keep going here. Verse 17. I keep asking that the God of our Father, Jesus Christ, the Lord uh, the glorious Father may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. We're going to take this apart a little bit. So that you may know him better. So that, here's your purpose. A prayer with a purpose. He's praying for them so that they will know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he he has called you the riches of his glorious inheritance in the holy in his holy people we are his inheritance any of you got an inheritance coming uh, any of you ever yeah that's the one that matters and it excites us we make plans based on that inheritance we get lawyers based on that inheritance I've seen some things at funeral homes you would not believe because of people thinking about an inheritance. It motivates us. Well, let's turn this around in a positive way. We are God, Christ's inheritance. We are. That's an awesome passage right there. Verse 19. And his incomparably great power for us who believe. The power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the heavenly realms. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominions and every name that is invoked. Not only in the present age but also the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church. Which is his body. The fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Paul had a relationship with these people. And from that relationship, there was something special that happened. First of all, it was a unity of faith. What kind of faith? That passage talks to us about saving faith. Faith that we put in Christ that brings us to a motivated action in our life to confess our sins, to see ourselves the way we are, to believe and act on that belief and motivate us to move in a positive direction. That is what saving faith does. Sa saving faith doesn't leave us sitting on our hands going, well, what do I do next? Saving faith moves us. I'm forgiven. My faith in Christ moves me to love you when you're not very nice to be around. It puts us together as a church of broken people with messy lives. Saving faith is powerful. And that's where Paul joined these people at the heart of saving faith. Also, he talked about being united in love. Their faith was producing bonds of love. Peggy and I just uh, spent the last year uh, with a, an associate that was going to take my place. The Sunday came, the 28th of April, and it was time for Mike to leave and for Andy to take over. The next Sunday was horrible. 
We couldn't go to church with our friends of 18 years. We needed to let Andy establish his place and we needed to move out of the picture. It broke our hearts. It was hard not to be, a, my wife taught Sunday school and I thought she was gonna have a coronary because she didn't know what the little girls were gonna do that she'd been teaching all these years. It's horrible. We have bonds in the family of faith. This week I learned that Kay Morrison and my family have been blessing each other for years. And it's right here. There is a network among us that God has pulled together of a family of faith that come together and it builds these bonds of love. It's why when we go through tough times, you find those Christian brothers and sisters walking in through your door instead of running from your troubles. We're different. We're different in the world, and that's something I want to belong to. You see, I don't want you to pretend that you like me because I'm good. You love me because I'm forgiven, and I belong to the Savior who gave you the same forgiveness. And He helps us to see each other with honest eyes. None of us are perfect. None of us deserve what we've been given. And yet we come together, little, tall, big, wide, strong, weak, sick, healthy, to make a body. We are united, though, in a special way that Paul talked about. Here he is, a long way away from these people, writing them a letter because he's united with them in prayer. How far are you away from me this week when you pray for me? And I live all the way over in Montgomery County. How far are we away from each other when we pray for each other? We are of one spirit. Our physical place may be different. You might have a son that's in the military. You might have a daughter that's in the military. You might have a wayward child that who knows where they are and what they're up to. How far is your prayer away from them? Uh-uh, buddy. It's right there. Paul knew that and he gives us that. We're united through prayer. And his persistence in prayer teaches us that we should remember that we need to pray for each other. I'm going to challenge you to something that might feel good by next Sunday. I'm going to ask you today to think about somebody that God will lay on your heart. Just ask God, forget what I'm talking about, stop for just a moment, and see if God lays someone on your heart before you leave here today or maybe later today to pray for this week. Take their name to heaven every day this week. Maybe one of your children. It may be the enemy that you've been struggling with all week. But come back together next week and see if you don't walk in these doors looking to see what happened in that person's life this week. You will have an amazing, an amazing conversation with them next week. If you'll try this. I just challenge you to do it. And if you don't, that's okay. But you're going to miss something. You pray for somebody you know you want to pray for. See if it changes the relationship. Now, you can get your little paper out because I'm going to give you the fill-in things. Here we go. Verse 17 talks about the fact that, that Paul wanted something better for them. That's what happens when you love somebody. They get a new car, you don't go, doggone it, they got a new car. You go, wow, I'm so glad you're blessed. And you share in their joy. You don't even need to go out and get a new one yourself. You can be, sh and maybe they'll come and pick you up when your old clunker quits. <laughs> but you share in their joy. When we go into this, Paul says, I want you to have a better mind. The word that he used there is, is an energetic mind, not a lethargic mind, not a low energy mind, but one that spins like an ADD kid out of control on too much sugar. He wants you to be thinking about this, to be motivated by this. He wanted them to know that they could experience a deeper level of intimacy with God, a spirit of wisdom. You know, we in the Christian church have been afraid sometimes to talk about the Holy Spirit, haven't we? We're afraid someone's going to start babbling on in some language that we don't know and start doing things that are crazy. But we've cut ourselves off from a part of the Godhead in doing so. And I'm not afraid, I have been in the past, but I'm not afraid to tell you that we have not lived in the power of God's Spirit deeply enough. On a deep level, 
1 uh, Corinthians 6, I'm not going to take you there today, but, but I want you to read that, that, that second chapter, 16 through 20. Maybe do that later in the, in the Bible study that follows. The Holy Spirit does the revealing of what's in God's Word to us. It's not because you're so smart you just get it. It's not so smart because I studied so many years in college. It's because the Holy Spirit reveals this stuff to you so that you can use it. Otherwise, it's just putting more rocks on your sack. Well, I know I should love my neighbor and do all the Ten Commandments and all that stuff. And, and how many of us get that done? We go next. It says that Paul, in verse 18, wants us to have an enlightened heart. What do you think about when you think about an enlightened heart? Paul wanted them to know that they had a hope that was real, which they had been called to. Remember earlier in the chapter he says, you've been chosen? We were called to this hope. You're not just a lucky guy with a number caught in the lottery and you want a, a new t-shirt. This is the forever game. This is eternal life. Our hearts, when everybody else is going, well, I'm really sad, I'm down in the dumps, you know, life isn't good, I don't have the job I want, I'm not as good as I want, I can't be this, I can't. We're thinking, look at who I am in Christ. Did you remember what we talked about last week? We don't have a reason to come here and be sad sacks. You get that way sometimes. There's a human breakdown in the nature of us that does that. But when you get around other brothers and sisters, as Paul was here in a prison cell, writing these words to us. When it says that this church was to the Ephesians, if you study this very deeply, you'll see that this church was to encourage all the churches around Ephesus. So this is to us also. He wanted us to have an enlightened heart, to enjoy the abundant life, the glorious inheritance which we are to Christ should put some spunk in our step. We're something special. We're somebody's inheritance. And he wants us to have an energized life, verses 19 through 23. Energized. Not one of these, well, I'm going to retire and sit down in a rocker. <laughs> and the next year, I might just rock. <laughs> he wants us to have an energized life. Hey guys, I got some snow on the roof, but there's a fire in the furnace. I want to be alive while I'm alive. And I do that through being energized. The, Easter, the Energizer Bunny doesn't have anything over on us. He wants us to have a power. You know, some of the words he used for power in this passage are amazing. First of all was the word power, which is dunamos, which that's a Greek word that we would translate for dynamite. He used another word, working power. It's called enigma which refers to a power in motion. It's kind of like you got the electricity, but now you got the amps, and away we go. It's, it's energy in motion. And he talked about power as iscus, which is muscle power, strength. And he talked about strength as keratos, which is a revealed, supreme, superior, sovereign power over everything else. That was the kind of power he wanted for us. He didn't give us this power so we could sit back and do one thing right in our Christian life. That's come to church and hold down that seat. He gave us power to do something with. Now, I'm not going to beat you down with that. I'm going to say, if you've been feeling a little lethargic lately, Geritol might be your answer. No, I'm going to say, God's Spirit living in you. He wanted us to live in this revealed wisdom and knowledge. And the more you know about God, the more the Holy Spirit reveals to you, the more energy you have for life and godliness. One of the things that we do a lot that really slows us down is we don't see that there's, there's power in our lives through prayer. We don't see that prayer is that power place in our life. When we look at the resurrection power Jesus was talking about, how much power did that take? You can't even put it to some kind of scale. A doctor can't even explain it. Scientists cannot explain it. If they could, they'd make it happen or tell you they could. Nothing can take something dead. You remember back in that story 
in Ezekiel 37. Of course, all you Bible students are going, oh yeah, I remember that. That was the Valley of the Dry Bones. That Ezekiel was told that uh, he was going to prophesy against Edom. The Israelites were in captivity. There was no hope. So God takes uh, Ezekiel and he says, I want you to look across this valley. And here they are spread bones all over the place. And he says to Ezekiel, he says, can these bones live? What would your answer be? My in internal, honest answer would be, no. They're dead. Well, Ezekiel was told then to preach to these bones. These dead, dry, scattered bones laying all disjointed all over the place. I have preached a few sermons myself to some But what happened? What happened in the story? The bones came together. Flesh came to them and, and the, the sinews and the tendons all came and, it, and life was there again. And he was telling Israel, they divided north and south. It was a fractured world for them. And God did put them back together and they did live again. And the same thing happens in your life. In your brokenness. How many things have we looked at in the last few months and weeks on television we thought this is just a broken world it's a mess there's no hope and we Christians go diving underneath our security blanket which is usually our government our insurance our doctors our security blankets our money our 401k and instead of turning to God in prayer we've turned to what our earthly securities are I'm going to give you something as I conclude this don't get excited <laughs> If I get excited about the conclusion, it may not be very short. I read a book not long ago uh, called Pressures Off by a guy named Larry Crabb. And it says, we live our Christian lives basically under the strategy of Moses. Remember Moses? He was given these rules. You do this, this, and this, and you get this, this, and this. So we do the very same thing with our prayer life. God, if I do this and this and this, will you give me this and this and this? And when we don't get it, being good, faithful Christians, we just go back and we do it better. We do it harder. We do it again. We become sacrificial about it. We even pat ourselves on the back because we've done it more than once. And we think, if I can just, God, if you can just give me this, then my life will be this. This is called linear thinking. What I need to tell you is, we need to come to a different way of thinking that comes under Jesus. The thinking that comes under Jesus is we need to quit seeking God's hand and start learning God's heart. You see, we want to have that genie in the sky that fixes all of our problems, don't we? We really do, all of us. God, I want this. I don't want this disease, God. Can you fix this disease? I will be better. That's not the way God works. The Spirit teaches us, and Paul is trying to get this through to us through part of this lesson. What God wants most is for you to come and spend time in His presence. And then let's see what happens. We need to quit seeking God for His blessings and start enjoying Him for His presence. You know, you may think it's wasted time, especially you guys that are used to action. You may think it's the dumbest thing in the world just to sit somewhere, get on your knees somewhere, get off quiet, go take a walk through the woods and say, God, I just want to be near you. What did Jesus do during the most important times of his life? He didn't go toward people, folks. He went toward his Father. He was setting an example for us. And that's what Paul's doing here. He goes to prayer in the most important times of his life. What would you say the most important times in your life have been? Oh, when my kids were born or this or this. And those are all great things. But nothing can be greater than spending time with your Creator who loves you. You are His inheritance. He is the head. We are the body, the Scripture tells us today. God, give me enough money and I'll have a good life and I'll love you a lot more. No. We need to discover that where there is the, God, the presence of God is the place we will find our liberty, our peace, and our purpose. 
Now, I want you to love the thought of that so much that you're intrigued. And you want that. I didn't preach this sermon, so you'd go home going, oh no, I've got to spend a lot more time in prayer. What I want to tell you is there's something awaiting you that you're really going to like when you spend time in the presence of God. That's where the pressure's off. When the little alarm buttons start going off in your head, when there are five people standing at your door wanting your information, I was listening. There were actually three. There's a little bell that goes off in a Christian's head that says, ah, but the pressure off place is in the presence of God. You put the presence of God in that room and then you invite them in. Now you got it right. You operate from that strength, that power, that energized, that better heart, and all those things that you bring to this world that make people look at you and go, I don't know what they got, but I want it. Are you going to be one of those kind of people? All right, I've given you a couple challenges. I challenge you to pray for somebody in this body or somebody in your life that you're going to see for a week and then check in with them in a week. See how things are going. You pray for them every day. Take them in front of God. And I want you to see what happens when you pray with the power available to you in prayer. Man, I am sorry for preaching so long. But I did. Let's pray. Father, thank you for each person who is here today. I know that if I got to know them better, I would be dazzled at what you've done in their life. I would be giving you praise and honor because you have made them special. I pray as we study through this book of Ephesians, we'll see and sense who we are and that we'll sense in a way that we can use that power that you have given us to influence a world that's going the other way. Lord, if there's someone here today that needs to reconnect with you, to spend time in your presence, I pray that that thought starts right here and now and will not be complete until there's a time in your presence. It's my ultimate hope for why I preached this sermon today. In Jesus' name. Community Christian Church, 1944 South Jackson Street, Frankfort, Indiana.